Center for the Study of War and Society and the coordinator of this year's McCarthy Lecture Series entitled Spy Games, War and Espionage in the 20th Century. Um, so we've had three talks up until this point, um, and tonight we bring the series to a close um, with uh, a fantastic final uh, entry by uh, Dr. Larry Berman entitled the, the Perfect Spy, or Perfect Spy, pardon me, The Incredible Double Life of Fan Soon An, Time Magazine reporter and Vietnam, our Vietnamese communist agent. Um, and before I uh, introduce uh, Dr. Berman, I just want to uh, first thank Dr. Richard McCarthy, who just walked in, and Time to Chief, sorry, Matt, yeah. as well as uh, Dr. Craig Howard, who I do not see yet, but yes, um, as, who are the major patrons of the, uh, the McCarthy Lecture Series. Um, and have in fact been patrons and supporters of the Dale Center really since its earliest days. Um, and we're really very happy to be uh, celebrating this year the 14th year of the Richard McCarthy Lecture Series. Over the years, I know many of you have joined us. There have been a lot of great um, uh, focus series from Native American warfare to Asian warfare to war on the press um, to uh, the Southern way of war. Um, we've brought in special guest speakers. We've done roundtables with veterans. It's been a lot of great programming. And if you've missed any of that and want to catch up on it, please bear in mind that we have a YouTube channel. And many of our past events, as well as tonight's talk, will be available there. Um, if you want uh, more information about the McCarthy Lecture Series or just Dale Center events more broadly, we have a sign-up sheet over there on the uh, table as well as some literature that you can take with you, including for some of our newest initiatives, including war tours and uh, war stories. There's also a separate sign-up sheet for students if you're here for a class. Although students, you are also very welcome to join the general sign-up list if you want to uh, receive our correspondence. And then the last thing I'll say is that the uh, Dale Center is also on social media. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, and if you want to tweet about uh, the uh, lecture tonight, the hashtag is McCarthy Lectures, but of course, make sure to silence your phone in advance. And now it's my great pleasure to um, introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Larry Berman, Berman, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Davis and currently the founding dean of the Honors College at Georgia State University. He holds a doctorate from Princeton University and is an internationally recognized expert on American politics, foreign policy, the American presidency, and the war in Vietnam. He is in fact the author of several books on Vietnam War related topics, the most recent being Zumwalt, The Life and Times of Admiral Elmo Russell Bud Zumwalt Jr., as well of course, Perfect Spy, which um, tonight's talk is based upon. Um, to name only a few of his many academic honors, he has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. He's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Inter International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. He has also been the recipient of the Richard E. Neustadt Award, given annually for the best book published on the history of the American presidency, and the Burnout Lecture Prize, given annually, annually by the Society for the Historians of American Foreign Relations, to a scholar whose work has most contributed to our understanding of foreign relations. So we're very uh, lucky to have a scholar of Dr. Berman's stature here to help us close out um, the McCarthy series. And I will now turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Is this my phone? Today? Yeah, it's your phone. I was <laughs> gonna, you should have told me. I was going to yeah. answer it for you. Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank, can you all hear me? Hear me? Uh, well, thank you, Allison. Uh, you know, the closest we ever come to perfection is in resumes and introductions that we write by ourselves and give to someone like Allison. So that sounded great uh, 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 on that. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, a real pleasure. I spent a uh, better part of uh, the week probably watching uh, almost all of the McCarthy uh, uh, lectures that have been posted on YouTube. I hope to uh, do them justice uh, uh, tonight. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a, a man, uh, Pham Sunan, a spy. But, uh, and this is a story tonight, but not only about a spy uh, and about war, but also about peace and reconciliation. And I'll try to do all of that within the time allotted to me. But there are certain questions that I really want to explore tonight. Uh, the, uh, these questions are, what goes on in the heart of a spy? What makes he or she tick? Can a spy truly have friends? How does a spy live with himself or herself? And how do friends and colleagues 
react when they find out that the person that they trusted, that they loved, that they knew so well, had lied to them about who he or she was, had deceived them, and that that person's entire life was a mask, a mask that was created to accomplish a goal, and in this case the goal was to get the Americans to leave Vietnam, to be defeated in Vietnam. So tonight I'm going to look at what we call the twisted schemes of truth and lies that make up the life of Pham Soon An, the most important and productive spy of the war, the one who survived. Almost every other enemy spy was rooted out or killed during the war. And I just have one important caveat, which is that most of Pham Soon An's life is still shrouded in mystery. In Vietnamese, the name An, as Pham Soon An, An means hidden. Like his name, his, his life remains a mystery. In the wilderness of mirrors, we often use to describe the world of intelligence gathering. Nothing tonight will be direct and linear, which is not an excuse to say the lecture won't be coherent. Uh, but the life of this man is not direct and linear. And I hope to leave you with many more questions uh, than I could possibly answer, because the bottom line is that a man who had spent his entire life deceiving others, uh, who am I to say that I wasn't the last one he deceived, right? It's a fair question, one that we can entertain at the end of, of tonight. Although it's my book, I wrote it, and I'm sticking with the story. Um, uh, and I find all of this so much more remarkable because when I first started writing about his life as a spy, uh, what I find most interesting and which I'll talk to you about tonight is what happened after the war ended when he was no longer a spy. And how his life as a spy shaped the rest of his life. And how he not only became part of the reconciliation process, but became probably the most valued and trusted Vietnamese to American presidents and yeah, presidents and uh, uh, ambassadors and generals, but all after the war. And how did it happen? The psychology of espionage, which you've probably heard about, I know you've heard about in the last two lectures, is tricky business because spies compartmentalize their lives in order to live their cover, to survive the tensions of living in two worlds. And make no mistake about it, that is what spies do. They compartmentalize, and in order to survive and not screw up and not make a mistake, that someone will then uncover them, they have to be extraordinarily disciplined. And in Pham Soon An's case, he wasn't like the James Bond character you heard about in the first lecture. He didn't do this for money, he didn't do it for fame, he didn't do it for flashy cars, he didn't do it for anything except for love of his country. But when he agreed to be a spy, the situation was so much different than what would have happened once the American intervention uh, uh, occurred. So uh, uh, I just could, there's been several Vietnamese versions. I'll skip it. So I'm going to talk about Pham Soon An tonight. All right. Uh, but who was Pham Soon An? Was he this man, the man who worked for Time magazine, or this man who, four years after the war, all of a sudden, all the friends who had loved Don and knew him as a colleague and trusted him found out that he was wearing this uniform and had been promoted to the rank of hero of a revolution and general Pham Soon An. Was, was he this man who trained the German shepherds and, and dogs and was the most renowned dog trainer in all of Saigon, who raised birds and sold them in the market? Or this man with General Ziop as he received his hero's commendation? So the template of Pham Soon An's life is known to many people in this room. During the war, in his cover, in his mask, in his mask, he was the informative, witty, chain-smoking, Time Magazine correspondent. He was known as General Gevral. Gevral was the coffee shop where everyone hung out to trade information. He was regarded as the dean of his trade by foreign reporters in Vietnam. 
He was a trusted source of the era's most well-known reporters. His best friends included David Halberstam, Neil Sheehan. Best friends. Stanley Carnell, Francis Fitzgerald, considered him a brother. But it wasn't only reporters who trusted him. He was trusted by the American CIA. William Colby, st station chief in Vietnam, valued his, not only valued his friendship in Vietnam, but after the war, after Colby had been CIA director and he found out about An, Colby made a special trip to Vietnam just to talk spy shop and spy business with Pham Soon An. And indeed, I'll tell you in a minute, Pham Soon An's trip to the United States was sponsored by who else? Because he needed a cover, the American CIA. And the person who sponsored him was General Edward Lansdale, the great anti-communist crusader. It's only fitting that he worked for Time Magazine so that the loose empire, the ardent anti-communist loose empire paid for his, you know, his paycheck, provided for his paycheck. The ironies should not escape anyone in this room. In his position, he had access to all US and, and South Vietnamese military bases. He was a regular at diplomatic receptions. His name appeared on every single accredited MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, uh, 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 correspondence list from 1965 through 1975. He smoked constantly, laughed easily, bred and raised German shepherds. This is he and his wife. Raised a family. But who was the who was this man? There he is with Fra Francis Fitzgerald. He seemed to fit in almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. And everyone wanted to hear what Ahn said, because Ahn always had information. This is Bob Shaplin, the Far East correspondent to the New Yorker, one of the most astute reporters uh, of, of his era. And on provided him always with information. And remember, I just said spies compartmentalized their life. So after the war ended, uh, every outfit around, especially accuracy and media, went to see if On, in all of his reporting for Time Magazine, had ever provided disinformation, had ever slanted things toward the VC perspective. And they found nothing. Why? Because An's mission was strategic intelligence, and it was much too risky for him to indeed try to create disinformation. Indeed, he went bent over backwards to be objective so that he would keep being relied on, because when people want information, they exchange information. And so An, there was no, not a single piece of evidence anywhere that in any story he ever, he ever contributed to or wrote, that there was a single bit of disinformation for a VC perspective. And the reason was because he had to live. And he had to live because his mission was to provide General Ziop and the Vietnamese, which we'll get to momentarily, with the most critical information on American war plans, for which he would later be recognized as the greatest spy of his era. But every day, imagine walking that tightrope of never knowing if one trip, one slip in the compartmentalization one slip in the mask would all of a sudden lead for you to be, as An said, like a fish on a cutting board. You know, never knowing if that day would be, would be his last one. Uh, his information and security tidbits were so good about what was going on in South Vietnam, it was rumored he must be secretly working for the CIA. And indeed, three times he was offered a job to work for the CIA because the CIA was unaware that he was an agent. So if he had accepted it, he would have become actually a triple agent. However, he took that request back to his superiors who said, no, don't do it. Even though it would be great to have you as a CIA agent, we need you more for the strategic intelligence you're, provi you're providing us. His circle included some of the most famous people in the CIA. Lou Conine, one of the most uh, heralded of the early, uh, early spies. Edward Lansdale, William Colby, and others. He was friends with the most notable Vietnamese politicians in general, including Win Cao Ki and, general tu, and, and uh, President Tu. Indeed, Win Cao Ki asked him to help train his dogs in South Vietnam, Air Marshal <coughs> Ki. 
What none of them knew was that their friend and source was living a dangerous secret life. It was all a cover for espionage. That he actually had a, a secret name, a code name, X6, which is what the Vietnamese title of my book is called, X6. He was a lone cell member of a group called 863, which originally had about 60 members in it, and their entire mission was to protect An and to protect his reports once he, he sent his reports north. And this wasn't like you went on the internet and sent it out. This was through Invisible Ink, and I'll take you through how he did, all, did it all, and couriers and drops and things like that. Over half that group of 863 died protecting On. And the whole group, 863, has been elevated in Vietnam to the rank of Hero Brigade, which means for them that they are the, uh, the highest uh, calling of the revolution during, 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 the, during the war. No one knew that X6, a lone cell member of 863 Intelligence Network that operated out of Coochie, the Coochie Tunnels, that An's life was a mask, a cover, an artificial designed disguise, a life that included invisible ink, microfilms, couriers, mail drops, intelligence reports. You couldn't make it up. Luke Conine after the war said, quote, you can't help admire a guy who is as skillful in his job. But An hated being a spy. He hated it. He did not enjoy it. He did not choose the life. He was ordered to do it. He accepted it as, a, as an obligation and a mission. And he sought neither money nor glory. And for over 20 years, he lived this life because he held a dream. And that dream, which I will give you a prelude of right now, but I'll really go into depth in the time I've later, later tonight, is that he dreamed of the day that America and Vietnam could reconcile and our two countries could live peacefully together, which is why I wear this lapel pin almost all the time, the two flags of Vietnam and the United States. It represented Pham Sunan's dream, and indeed it's particularly fitting that the President of the United States is in Vietnam tonight, in Hanoi, tonight. Uh, uh, and you think about, as I watch, the American Secret uh, Secret Service and, and protection folks all arriving in Hanoi wearing, you know, machine guns and all the uh, stuff. I mean, we once fought a war there, and if we had that armament back then, who knows, the outcome of the war might have been different, right? But uh, the fact of the matter is, the time is, this is Pham Sunan's dream uh, living today, and I'll take you, th I'll take you through this, uh, because I think that uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is important. Uh, on was certified, these are just a series of his uh, Every, uh, every, every press card that he ever had. This is the U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. Gave him access to all military uh, bases. Here he is in a military press briefing. Here he is again with uh, uh, General Cao Thi from the South Vietnamese, uh, the South Vietnamese Army. Here he is in Time Headquarters. He always seemed to blend in and to fit in and no one knew really who he, who, who, who he was. So let me just tell you, I think it's important, how did I meet Pham Sunan? Well, that's the night I met him, and the story about how I met him, and it's important for this one context, which it was my first, I've made over 63 or 64 trips to Vietnam since 2000. Almost all my scholarship is based there. I'm there quite often, obviously, um, and, uh, uh, but my first trip was in the summer of 2000. And, uh, uh, I happened to meet on, I was sitting next to him, the story is described in my book, but I didn't know who he was, right? I had no idea who he was. And he started talking about his time in California where he had studied college and we got to know each other there. I found him interesting and he kept talking and talking. His English was really great. He was a great conversationalist. Uh, he talked about not only his studies in the United States at Orange Coast College, but that he'd interned in the Sacramento Bee and he had a dear friend, Eleanor McClatchy of the McClatchy chain, that he had driven across the United States, uh, that he had interned in the United Nations, and he said he was good friends with Halberstam, Chaplin, uh, uh, Neil Sheehan, and all this stuff. And I'm just listening and I'm being I'm mesmerized by this, right? And finally he asked me what I was working on. I told him I was finishing a book. Uh, on the Paris peace negotiations, which would soon be published as uh, No Peace, No Honor, 
Nixon, Kissinger, and betrayal in Vietnam. And An said to me, and I didn't know who he was, right? I mean, he was a witty guy. I was a great conversationalist at dinner. Uh, he said, I know a lot about this subject. Uh, uh, you should come see me tomorrow at Givral Coffee House and we can talk for a few hours. And I told him I couldn't do it because I was leaving the next day for uh, Cambodia. And that night I really struggled with this and after, after dinner I asked my friends, who was this guy? And they told me who he was, that he was the top spy during the war and basically took me through the story that I just told, told you. And so my friend Khan Lay said, I mean, he offered to help you and you're going to, you know, you said you're, gonna, you're leaving? I said, yeah, man, I mean, we're going to Cambodia. I'm part of this delegation. And I, I went to sleep that night and I just, I couldn't sleep. I woke up the next morning and all 18 other people went to Cambodia and I stayed in Saigon. And I went to, I called on. He gave me his card, which I still carry in my wallet. Um, and uh, he, uh, I called him and I met him in Javral and we spent the next four days together. And he gave me some incredible information. And uh, then I wanted to write his book, but he said, no, you could no, I'm not. You know, he'd already turned down Halberstan and Sheehan, Sheehan uh, writing his memoir for something like $500,000 advance, right? So he just said to me, no, I, I, I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to let anyone ever write my, write my story. There, there's An with uh, Khan, who that night, Khan is the man who explained to me who An was right after, right after dinner. And then An, An read my book, No Peace, No Honor, and he really liked it. Right? That was important. He thought I was objective, I was a fair historian, that I had looked at both the Vietnamese and the American side, and now he really wanted to talk to me more. So I went to his home more and more, but he still said no, I couldn't write his, uh, his, uh, his, his story. Uh, he loved books, and then one day this picture appeared in the newspapers. Uh, he smoked five packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes for 55 years. And he always said the Americans finally won. They had introduced him to cigarette smoking, and they finally killed him. Uh, it just took longer, longer than they thought. Uh, so uh, after 55 years of smoking five packs of Lucky Strikes, uh, 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 unfiltered cigarettes, and it's just any picture you ever see of on, he was smoking. Uh, the, 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 the article newspaper said General Pham Sunan, hero of the revolution, uh, is, is, is going to die, you know, basically. And, you know, they took out about three quarters of his lunge, lungs, and he didn't die. He had severe emphysema, but he didn't die. And An asked to see me after he got back from the hospital. Uh, in his house, his bedroom, which had been upstairs, they had moved this hospital bed downstairs with the oxygen tank. And uh, instead of meeting in Gervral, where he couldn't go anymore, uh, we started meeting in his house. And it was at his first day when I got to the, I saw the bed, I saw the oxygen, and I saw on, I said, look, you're going to die. I said, everyone needs their story told. And it should be told by a historian, not someone who knew you during the war. Uh, and I want to write that story. And on to my surprise, said, okay. An thought he only had six months to live, but he lived for two, over two years. Uh, and so I took a sabbatical, and that's where my trips really, really started coming in. And An and I spent hours and hours together. Some of these pictures will look very, very frail, but this is what our days look like working together in his house. Uh, he provided me with a lot of information, uh, but mo best of all is that he started sharing his documents with me. But to give this, and I'll show you those documents in a minute, but to put this in context, I want to tell you an amazing story. So the thing about, and I should say, by the way, that my book is not based, and this story is not based just on on talking to me, all right? Uh, I conducted re research in many archives throughout the United States. For example, I went to Wisconsin to the Wisconsin Historical Society where Robert Chaplin, who was that Far East correspondent and An's very close friend, uh, uh, all of Chaplin's reporters' notebooks and diaries are, are deposited in this archive. And I found An came alive. An was his major source. So notebook after notebook, I'm reading about An, what An is telling Chaplin about the Tet Offensive. Something that An had helped plan for the other side, but Chaplin didn't know that, and An couldn't let him know that, but An had to provide him with an understanding of what the Tet Offensive was without tipping the hat that he had been planning it, and it was his reports that had helped make it a, a success. Uh, the Neil Sheehan papers in the Library of Congress have a wealth of information on An from back during the war. 
Sheehan relied on Ahn to help him understand like Oppbach and other places and what had happened. The Frank McCullough papers, the person Frank McCullough hired on at Time Magazine at the University of Nevada, Re uh, Reno, uh, all of McCullough's papers came alive with photos and other things about Pham Soon An, the decision to hire him, the, the quality of his reporting. The Lansdale papers at the Hoover Institution, Edward Lansdale, the, you know, with the first spook of, of our modern era. Uh, uh, when Lansdale found out that An was a spy and that someone sent him the picture, Lansdale said, it's impossible, I don't believe it. Misinformation, disinformation, whatever the term is. Uh, I interviewed dozens of his former colleagues and friends and only one person refused to speak to me. And, uh, uh, and so when I talk about the tracks of Pham Soon An's life, the story is really not just coming from him, it's coming from, a whole, for the graduate students in the audience, I mean, and for the undergraduates as well, uh, I mean, that's really a critical issue, which is, uh, I'm not a reporter, I just wasn't listening to him and writing it up. A lot of stuff that he told me I couldn't use because I couldn't verify it in archival material or, or in anywhere in the historical. Uh, in the in the historical uh, record, so An was born on September 12, 1927, in South in what was South Vietnam, ben, in Benoit. But what I want to tell you is that he came of age at the end of World War II. He joined the Viet Minh, which was the resistance movement against the French and against the J Japanese. At the, at the age of 18, he was fighting for independence from the occupiers, first Japan and then the colonialists, the French. In 1953, he joined the Communist Party because they were best organized to defeat the French. This was not a Communist Party like we think about today, especially the Viet, the, the Viet Minh in the Communist Party. He was sworn in in, so in southern Vietnam in Yu Minh Forest, and he was so sworn in by Mai Chi Ta, who was the younger brother of Le Duc Ta, who won, the, uh, who, who won the Nobel Prize with Henry Kissinger for negotiating the, uh, the, uh, the Paris Accords that supposedly ended the war. Kissinger would accept that award, and of course Le Duc Ta would never accept it because no peace had ever come to Vietnam based upon that piece of paper they had negotiated. Uh, he started off as a, a platoon commander in the Mekong Delta. He got a job as a censor in the post office. Uh, and then he joined the South Vietnamese Army in Saigon. And all of a sudden, the Americans in 1955 start showing up. Right, The, the French are defeated at the Bien Phu in 1954. And the, fret, and the, the Vietnamese finally think, hey, we're going to get the right to determine our own future now. We've defeated the French, they're gone. We've defeated the Japanese. The OSS, the American precursor to the CIA, had worked with Ho Chi Minh to help defeat the French in World War, in World War II. Ho had a code name with OSS. And indeed, we know that Ho's pleas to Truman were, were, were later dismissed, where he asked only that Vietnam be granted the same uh, opportunity the United States had granted the Philippines, which was the right to choose their own future. But as An always told me, and it's in my book, the U.S. always had a better idea for our future than we did. Um, and so all of a sudden the Americans start showing up, and it's not just Americans, it's, it's wealthy people who are going to create the Bank of Vietnam, but even more important, it's the, it, it's the CIA people, the, the precursor CIA people, particularly Edward Lansdale and Lou Conine. And they start showing up in Vietnam, and they look around and they find this young guy, Pham Soon An. He speaks English, he's bright, he's amicable, and uh, they decide we're gonna, he's going to be our protege. We're going to teach him about the spy craft. All right? And so they introduce him to the thinking of Sherman Kent, who's one of the founders of the CIA strategic thinking branch, how to dissemble information, how to, to, uh, to write reports. And the idea is that they're going to train on in Vietnam, and then they're going to sponsor him to go to the United States. So An takes this news to his superiors in the forest, and he tells them, and they said, well, great, we want you to go to the United States too, but it's great that Lansdale wants to sponsor you, right? So uh, they, they decide, well, if you're going to go study in America, what's the safest thing to study? And they decided, well, you're going to go major in journalism. Uh, but his mission in the, in the United States is going to be quite different than you might, uh, you might think. Uh, 
You know, he had served as a guide for Lansdale. Uh, he had endeared himself to Lansdale, and uh, he had been trained, right? But the thing is, is that uh, the Vietnamese, they wanted on, they didn't know who the Americans were. They really didn't. So they decided that An would become the equivalent of the Alexander de Tocqueville uh, of, of Vietnam, of America. In this case, uh, you know, Tocqueville, of course, had come and observed Americans and wrote a classic, Democracy in America. An's job would be to go study the American temperament. And his mission was to stay six years. And he was to learn everything about the Americans because the Viet Minh had determined that it was only a matter of time. This is 1957, right? 57. It's only a matter of time before the Americans will come. And the Americans will come with military, and we don't know who they are. We need to understand them. So one guy could be trusted, and that was on because he, had, he was really good at English. He had learned English from missionaries and way, and he was particularly skilled, and they turned him into a spy, just like that. So in, 1950, uh, in 1957, on gets on a plane and heads to California. This is the guy, Mai Chi Ta, who sent him. I interviewed him, and Lansdale had sponsored him. Uh, that's Luke Conine, uh, and he arrives in California. And he has almost an idyllic time in California. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing what happens. He becomes like, like all the undergraduates here. You may not dress like that, but that looks like your dorm room, probably. And uh, he got a job as a photographer, then as a journalist. He hung out at the beach at Newport Beach. Imagine being a Vietnamese. And this is the other irony in life. Catch this, right? The largest overseas population of Vietnamese Americans, where? Orange County, United States. Who was the first Vietnamese in Orange County? A communist spy. You couldn't make it up, right? And so uh, An arrives in, in, in Orange County, uh, 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 loves the beach. He becomes a real celebrity. He's the first Vietnamese that, uh, this is the president of, uh, of the college saying, take me home, An. Uh, that's what the caption says. He loves sailing. There he is with his cigarette. Uh, he loved, there he is again. Loved the American hi-fi. Loved his dorm room. And not only did he love it all, but he never spent a weekend in the dorm alone. Every, it was a commuter college, and everyone took on home to meet their Vietnamese friend, right? And I tell the stories in the book about people learned how to catch grasshoppers and eat them and cook them and things like that. But also, he, he was such an, uh, uh, an extraordinary conversationalist that uh, 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 parents just loved having him uh, uh, come over. And he babysat kids. He, just, he was just... Uh, he rarely spent a weekend alone uh, in, a, in, his two, in his two years in Orange Coast. Here he is. I actually really like this photo. On is up there. He's circled um, in the, oops. Oh, there's On right, right there. I was trying to find the, the, the clicker. But that's an all, all, uh, all academic conference. You can see Stanford there. My UC Davis Aggies are up there. Uh, and uh, there wasn't a part of collegiate life that On didn't participate in. There he is in the uh, Barnacle yearbook. The Barnacle was the yearbook. He was, learning the, he was learning a craft, writing. That's how he got into journalism. And he became really quite uh, good at it. And then he took on some really tough assignments. In 1958, he wrote a, 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 a film critique of the quiet American, Graham Greene's Quiet American, right? It's dangerous stuff as you try to decide how you're going to walk that slim line. But he, he compartmentalized it, and he did a really good job with it. He fell in love with this young uh, lady and uh, wanted, to, uh, 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 wanted to marry her, but uh, didn't have the courage to ask her. But uh, here, uh, he did have the courage to ask someone else to marry him. I'll show you in a minute. This is my f sort of my favorite photo. That's on it, with who? The governor, the governor of California, Governor Jer uh, 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 Edmund G. Brown. Right? How'd that happen? On won an award for, for journalism. And he was brought up, and Governor Brown claimed him as the leading force of anti-communist journalism in America, and we're sending him back. So the cover is being, my point is the cover, the artificial life, is being built. These things take time. So, and I was only in year two right now, right? Uh, and so the woman next to him, her name is Roseanne Rhodes. Don't forget her name, because there she is at one of my book signings. So she came out of the wood, there's Roseanne there, and she came out of the woodwork. To, to, uh, and she told me this amazing story about how An had asked her to marry him uh, and go back to Vietnam. And she had said no because 
Well, she said, she said no, but she always re when she read my book, she regretted it because she was in an unhappy marriage. She said she could have been married to the most famous spy of the war. And <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the great uh, moments. And, and then An introduced her to the person she did marry. And it says in the bottom, Pham Soon An of Vietnam gave me a firm old-fashioned introduction, September 8th, 1958, in our journalism class. He followed this with lots of friendly oriental advice. Uh, and, uh, and here it is, the cover is set. The Sacramento Bee does a feature story on, on Vietnam journalist aims to fight red propaganda. So it is amazing, I'm glad you said that. I didn't pay you to say that either, thank you. <laughs> that was unprompted, it is amazing. So in a period of just a few short years, this guy has gone from being Edward Lansdale's tour guide uh, to learning the basics and rudiments of spycraft to now, uh, in the first two years, he studied at Orange Coast College. Uh, he's built his cover. He's learning about Americans. And this is sort of part, this is Eleanor McClatchy when he was going to leave California to Pham Sunan. We were delighted to have had you uh, at the B and hope you will return to see us again with best wishes, Eleanor McClatchy. This was an assigned copy of a book that was in, that was in his library. So the thing I want to tell you about is that uh, um, something really special happened at Orange Coast. He learned not only journalism, but he fell in love with the idea of a free press, right? Now this is 59, right? So you have to remember that uh, you know, he didn't know what Vietnamese communism was going to be all about yet. He didn't know that the Socialist Republic of Vietnam uh, was going to, how it was going to evolve. He was coming to study Americans, and all of a sudden he learned this thing called the free press. There's more than one question, more than one answer. Right? Uh, uh, he fell in love with it. He fell in love with American spontaneity. He had never danced closely with a girl. He learned how to square dance and dance, and all these are things are in my book. He learned a new way of thinking, and he always said, it's throughout the book, this is why it became dangerous later on, that the Americans opened up my way to a whole new th thinking. He loved America. He loved Americans. And uh, this is what he wrote in his farewell editorial. He wrote weekly editorials at the Barnacle. I went down to Orange Coast College. I read every single one of them. Orange Coast is the pilot place where I learned how to adjust myself to a new culture, custom, and way of living here. Here I have for a first chance to review what I had heard and read about the new world in order to be more objective and to divert any kind of prejudice which unconsciously infiltrates the fold of my brain. I miss my family, friends, relatives, and countrymen as well as my native language and the small piece of land where I have been brought up. Fortunately, this loss is temporary. In addition, OCC faculty, staff, students treat me so nice, sometimes I feel I am living among the Vietnamese. And he wrote that in 1959, right? Um, uh, uh, even though I am very anxious to go back to Vietnam to see my motherland, the idea of leaving Orange Coast College, the genesis of my studies in the United States, has created a kind of unexplainable melancholy in my mind. Uh, it is here that I learned the American language of H.L. Mencken to enjoy the hi-fi, rock and roll, do my homework with the radio and the familiar heater noise, and to fill my lungs with the air of humorous jokes of my doormates. Uh, I feel inadequate to express faithfully my feelings at the approach of the unavoidable separation in this short article without omitting thousands of peaceful and lasting souvenirs which have contributed a great deal of, to my happiness. The hope of seeing Orange Coast each year makes my dream of having wings of migrating swallows which fly back to Orange Coast each spring to build their nests under the roof of the counseling center. Here is the place where I have received precious advice. Instead of saying goodbye, I prefer to say good luck, hope to see you again. An had three symbols that defined his life, and you'll see the pictures momentarily. Fish, dogs, and birds. Do think about it as a spy, but think about it as something else as well. Dogs are forever loyal. Forever loyal, no matter whatever happens, a dog will stick, stick by you. Fish never speak. And birds are free to fly anywhere. And those swallows that he was referring to, that's where that came from. Those, those three things. An bought this car. Got this California driver's license. And again, he was given this gift uh, 
uh, by everyone on the Barnacle staff who, uh, who he had worked with. They loved on. And he took this book. He took out all the souvenirs from me one day. Uh, and, uh, and he drove across the United States to go intern at the United Nations. And what happened on that drive? That, that eight to 10 day drive across the United States, all he did, uh, he didn't ever stay in a hotel. Uh, people, uh, his car broke down for two nights. People took him in. Uh, uh, people uh, uh, people uh, fed him, befriended him. He didn't have a single problem going across the United States. And he just, he, he took, he, he, and he, what he discovered was this American temperament of what he saw as something that the, Viet the re that his country men uh, could learn so much from. That's all before the American War, all before the, the American War. Interned at the United Nations, and then he gets, you know, he, he's in New York City, and he's been offered a job, uh, and, he, and he's supposed to be there for six years, but in 1959 in Vietnam, if there are Vietnam, Vietnam scholars here, you know, this is the year that Ziem and his brother uh, uh, begin cracking down on VC, and they're locking everyone up, and people are ending up in jail, and there's a big, uh, a, a, a lot, it, it's very dangerous. And Am receives a secret message from his brother that he has to come home. And An didn't have to go home. He knew what was happening in Vietnam. He knew how dangerous it was. How did he know that someone hadn't given him up to one of the torturers already? How did he know that when he got off the plane, he wasn't going to get arrested? Uh, but he, his love of his country and his duty to mission, his mission, uh, he, he decided to, uh, uh, to go home. And uh, the rest is really history, and I'm, I'll take you through that right now. Uh, General Zia proclaimed, "We are now in the American war. Uh, we are we are now in the American uh, war room." So on comes home. He gets a couple of jobs uh, working for various newspapers uh, and st as a stringer and here or there. But eventually, he becomes Time Magazine's uh, reporter with all those credentials, and he starts obtaining information. His mission was a strategic intelligence agent. What that meant was he never stole a document ever in the entire duration of his life as a spy, anything he got was given to him by the CIO, the Central Intelligence Organization Agency of, of, of Vietnam, the, the American military, MACV. And people exchanged information. They were trying to understand what was going on. The Vietnamese wanted to understand the Americans. The Americans wanted to understand the Vietnamese. So what is An's job? An's job is to discern America's battlefield strategies. And once he does that, the first one was going to be American doctrine of counterinsurgency. The Vietnamese had no idea what counterinsurgency was, right? And so the, 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 me the message came to him, try to find out about counterinsurgency. Well, that was pretty easy because all on had to do was go to the American military and to the, the Vietnamese military, get all the documents, read all about it, tell them that he was writing a story for Time Magazine on counterinsurgency doctrine, distill it all, and he was so freaking smart and so able to put the stuff together that then he wrote up a report. Now, don't forget, because these are reports that the Viet Cong would never see, right? And then on, at night, secretly writing in invisible ink, uh, would write up reports uh, that would then be wrapped in microfilm and hidden in these Vietnamese kind of roles. Uh, and so what happened, uh, what, what they were in the American war room. So Ahn is, showing me the, and I'll sh Ahn is showing me these kinds of documents, field force level, these are, uh, these are strength levels, location of U.S. forces in Vietnam, field force. I mean, they're, they're, they're not confidential now, but you can bet they were confidential uh, back then. So there's a funny story about these documents. I told you that Ahn almost, Ahn almost died in the Vietnamese tradition. Uh, you are bo you're buried with your secrets. So An's wife had taken all these documents and put them in his coffin. Um, and when An lived, the coffin was left in the backyard along with his documents. So when I'm interviewing An, An would say to me, oh, I want to show you those documents. And we have to go out to the coffin uh, to get them. <laughs> and, and it's a really strange thing to be digging these documents out of a coffin that had been, that, he, where, where, that was made for An. And eventually he he was put in that coffin, but not until I was done um, uh, uh, with, with, with the book. And um, uh, field force, this is the order of battle. And these are the things that he was getting regularly, plus the Vietnamese. These are his handwritten notes over by leak summary of, uh, of activities. And so what would happen? What would happen is 
this woman, Win Ti Ba, was his courier. Uh, she was picked, handpicked by An. She was later promoted to the rank, rank of general. And An would write those reports in invisible ink. They wouldn't be able to be seen until an iodine solution was placed over it in the tunnels of Kuchi, and it was transmitted up to, up to Kozvin. And An would meet her somewhere, uh, and uh, there would be some sort of conversation between the two of them. Uh, as she, he, he would ask her if she wanted to try one of the rolls or something like that. She would take some, and then he would say, oh, here, take the rest of them. And then this very nondescript woman uh, would then start her journey of about 15 to 20 miles, or 20 clicks, uh, to Kuchi, where 863 was waiting for the for these for these for these materials, I spent hours interviewing her. It was really one of the uh, really interesting times in my uh, my younger days. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, eight six three, they showed me how once they got the reports, uh, they took me to their safe house and how the reports were transmitted uh, uh, up up to Kuchi and then from Kuchi up to uh, up to North Vietnam. Here are some of the surviving members of the eight six three network uh, and. Uh, so what did An's reports? Uh, what did An's reports do? So An received, and he didn't know he was receiving uh, any of these uh, uh, any of these medals. Uh, the first one he received was for his contributions at Opbach in January 1963, which was really the most significant, I think, of all of his medals because he proved. It was his first, but he proved his worth to his superiors. And it was this one that, uh, that General Ziop said, we are in the American uh, 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 war, war room. Only two people received a medal for what happened at Apoc. One was the commanding general, or the, uh, uh, the commanding field officer for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Viet Cong, and the other was Pham Soon An for, quote, tactical intelligence of impending military operations. What he helped was, what he did at Opak was to explain in his reports how to down the American helicopters, how to combat what was going on in this new concept of warfare, and indeed uh, Opak was a significant and a revolutionary victory for the Viet Cong and if you haven't been to Appa, if you go to Vietnam, it's really worth going out to take a look at this battle site and how it's commemorated uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Vietnam. But he was just getting started. He wrote a report that for, which, for which he received another medal uh, for the fact that the Americans were coming full force in April of 1965 and then in July of 1965. He saw it coming. The Vietnamese didn't think the Americans would ever Americanize the war. They thought maybe a battle or two, but were they will, really willing to commit 500,000 American troops? An's report said yes, they were. The most interesting uh, role that he played probably was in the Tet Offensive of 1968, for which he received another uh, uh, heroic uh, a medal, because what happened was, in this case, the Vietnamese sent down a high-ranking uh, person uh, his name is Tu Khan, to work with, Khan, uh, with An and, and to help infiltrate all of the different sites and to, and to then re send reports back as to which ways to get into the city for this assault that would occur uh, on, on, uh, on Saigon in, uh, in, in 1968. It was this man, General Tu Khan. Uh, uh, who, there he is, I'm at his home there, and that's where he's there with his uh, hero, cert hero certificate. Uh, and uh, it was a very, very difficult time for Ron because he was a reporter for Time Magazine and is responsible for covering things that are going on. And he had to develop a whole cover for Tucan. It was the first time he was working not solo. And uh, it was, it was, it, 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 he, he, pull, he, he basically uh, uh, pulled it off. It was truly a schizophrenic life during the Tet Offensive. Offensive. He was expected to assist reporters in understanding the enemy offensive. He took Bob Shaplet around Saigon in, in the same Renault that he, just the day before he had used to show Tu Kong all the sites that they should be infiltrating. His reports were so detailed that he received the medal. And then in April 1975, he would receive another medal. But here's the key to understanding Pham Soon An as the Amer last American helicopter is taking off. Uh, uh, 
It's April 1975, and the Americans are evacuating, right? Everyone remembers this iconic uh, photo. I'll tell you about this man in a second. But uh, so Time Magazine is, is evacuating, right? On's a reporter for Time Magazine. Chaplin, everyone wanted On to get out. He was going to get killed by the, or jailed by the incoming uh, North Vietnamese for, forces. Uh, on evacuated his wife and four children because, as he said, what is he supposed to do as this victorious North Vietnamese army comes into Vietnam? Say, hey guys, I'm really on your side. Don't worry, I'm Pham Soon On. I'm you know, working for Time Magazine, but I'm really a revolutionary. He said, no, they'd kill him and eat his dogs, right? So that was what he said. That's the exact quote. So uh, An evacuated his family, but he stayed. And, but first, there was, there was a lot of discussion in Hanoi about whether to send On to America to continue his spying. But An didn't want to leave his, his aging mother. And so uh, uh, he was allowed to stay behind. So he stayed behind in the Continental Hotel uh, in, a, in, in a room. And he had to hide for about five days. Um, and finally, he came out. There was a lot of, he tried to explain who he was, and it would take over three weeks for someone to really, for the news to come that he's on our side. Uh, so he was spared uh, what, 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 what would happen. Here's his wife and family. The first new, everyone, the cover was still intact in 1976 and 77, but then news came that his family, which had moved to Virginia, and the schools, the kids were in school, they had a sponsor, they were like all other Vietnamese families who had evacuated, the news came, come home. Well, let me tell you, in 1976 and 77, there were no Vietnamese Americans going back to Vietnam. So when they showed up in Paris and then Russia, people said, oh, wait, you know, because again, you couldn't get on a plane and fly back to Vietnam like you can, you can today. It was a very circuitous route. You had to go to Paris, then you had to go to the Soviet Union, and then you had to go from the Soviet Union uh, to, uh, to to Vietnam, or you could go through China, but tensions between China and Vietnam were very high at the time. It took them over 18 months for them to come back. But when they got back, uh, uh, and so, the, so uh, when they got back, everyone knew the cover, you know, they, people knew something had happened. But here's the thing, Pham Soon An began talking, and he kept telling the victorious side, the winning side, hey, who knows the Americans better than anyone in this room? I do. I lived with them. You sent me. This was my mission. They are great people. They've got this education system. They've got this free press. They've got this way of living. I mean, they're gone. That's all we wanted. That's why I joined the revolution. That's why so many of us joined the revolution. Let's like have a kumbaya moment. Literally, that's what he was saying, right? And Hanoi was so scared about what he was saying and thought he was so dangerous that they took him and they sent him for 16 months to a re-education institute where they told him he had to read for 18 months all of the great economic works written by Stalin and Lenin, you know, and all Marxism and all this other stuff. And he said, he, it's too late, man. I've, I've been exposed to the American way of thinking. So it was a poor, he failed indoctrination is what he said. So they sent him back and they put him under house arrest for nine years with no contact with anybody. But oh, by 1986 and 87, as Des Moines is occurring, which is the opening up, that is, the, I mean, this is what Trump is offering North Korea, right? You could be another Vietnam. Keep your, keep your socialist system. No free press, right? No, no free press. Uh, uh, oppress the people. No religious freedom. But hey, man, you can get all the hotels you want and all the food, right? That's what Vietnam is. All the benefits. And you know, what's Kim Jong Un to be afraid of, right? I mean, hey, man, if we can, we can have, if we can have that. Why not? So I'm being facetious, of course, but the point is that Vietnam was a basket case in 1985, 86. It had two allies, right? Cuba and the Soviet Union, right? And uh, uh, there was no money. It was dark. There was no electricity. They were forced to reach out to the uh, out to the West, and with that. With that expansion came openings. And one of the openings was Americans were allowed to start coming back to Vietnam. So they all came back. All the journalists. Chaplin came back. Uh, they all came back. Will Col Colby came back. Everyone came back wanting to talk to Pham, Pham Soon An, wanting to find out what had happened, all about his life. But An had no contact with anyone for this whole period of time. But he had one more dream, which was to come back to Orange Coast College, come back to America. He asked for a visa. 
and the visa was denied. They told him you could never leave the country. So on though, he was smart. Uh, he was a great analyst. And he, he, he was working as an analyst on Chinese, you know, the tension between Vietnam and China. So he was their top China uh, uh, analyst of all the Chinese, stolen Chinese documents and captured documents that the Vietnamese had gotten about Chinese intentions <coughs> from everything from the Spratleys to <coughs> offenses, you know, beginning with the 1979 war between Vietnam and, uh, uh, and China. So An said, well, look, if you won't let me go back, I'll continue my work for you, but you have to let my son, my firstborn son, go study. I want my children to have the same opportunity that I had to study in America because it's the greatest system in the world. So they said, okay, we'll let, we'll let them go. Time Magazine and An's friends raised $30,000. I depict the story in the book. And first he went to North Carolina to get his undergraduate degree in journalism and then Duke University Law School, right? So, uh, and on continued to work uh, as an intelligent analyst uh, up until literally uh, the last year before he, he, he died. And here's the greatest thing, that young man, you know, you know, think about it now, you couldn't make this up, this is why the, the, uh, you couldn't make it up. That young man, the firstborn son of an American spy who is then in part of a deal, goes and studies at North Carolina, then goes and studies at Duke ends up being not only the official translator for President Bush, uh, but has been in the White House three times, uh, and Bush has you know, given, him a, given him a nickname, and uh, he always rubs it in on me. He goes, can you believe, I mean, I've, I've been there three times. He's been the translator for two different, two different presidents. And uh, 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 there he is all the way to the, your right, to your right, last in line. And uh, 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 it's, it's unbelievable, but it gets even more unbelievable as it goes on. When on, when on, uh, uh, when on died of uh, emphysema on September 20th, 2006, just eight days before his 78th birthday, all of the tributes came in. So let me just show you a few things. With our deepest gratitude for your counsel and encouragement, the Fulbright Economics Teaching Program. Uh, in admiration, loving memory of Pham Sunan, this is from the Sheehan family. Uh, the Harvard program, to our beloved teacher, Pham Sunan, will always cherish your, your wisdom and friendship. And the reason for that is that uh, from the moment the war ended, there was only one voice in Vietnam that preached reconciliation, that preached the benefits of Americans and Vietnamese working together for a better future. And that was the most heralded spy of the war. Because for on, spying was uh, something he didn't like, it was an occupation, he was great at it, but when his mission was over, the Americans were gone, Vietnam was united, what else was left? What else was left was to tell people about the United States. And, uh, you know, he had the state funeral, and, you know, in Vietnamese tradition, uh, as you prepare for the journey to your nef next life, and you have your nourishment, and you have your joss sticks, and certain photos, and, and his medals, uh, the one you notice right in front there, the, his most cherished menu was from, from Orange, Coast, uh, Orange Coast College. His family put that there, I did not. In other words, uh, uh, the, this was who Pham Sunan was, a very complex mix. So uh, he died uh, just a few months before the book was published. Uh, there I am at his grave where I'm going to light some joss sticks and leave the book. But there are the symbols of his life, the fish, the dog, and the, and the birds. Uh, and he had specifically asked not to be buried in this, uh, in this military cemetery, but, you know, again, it's Vietnam. Um, and uh, uh, there is an old photo surrounded by his, his symbols. Uh, but this is my favorite photo in the, in the entire presentation, which is the very first ship, the U.S. vessel, to ever go back into Vietnam was the USS Vandegrift. The USS Vandegrift came back. Now, again, you have to put yourself in perspective here. The war has been over. 15 years or so, but now, 12 years, but now an American ship is going to come in, a battleship. And you know, the jokes were running at the time, but if there's some Vietnamese who hasn't read the news in 14 years and sees the ship, he's going to run out, think the Americans are back, you know, and might shoot at it and things, and a lot of jokes were going on. But the, the, it comes, the ship comes in, and this is the U.S. Consul Gen General, Emmy uh, Magaguchi, uh, and there's Young An, and there's General An, and that's the Commander, uh, Commander Rogers, and that's some really cagey intern who got into the photo. Uh, but uh, 
the VIP, de uh, the VIP guest on the list by the Consul General and the U.S. Ambassador was Pham Sunan. So, so just to tell you, I didn't make all this stuff. How does someone who is the top spy and the most heralded spy of the war end up being the VIP guest of the U.S. Ambassador and the U.S. Uh, a consul general on the first ship that comes back because they recognize much better than I, I could relate to you now the insights and the values and the understanding that on had for American culture, society, and what we all know, which is that governments fight wars and people die for them, right? But when the wars are over, right, there's such a commonality between people. And An believed that. So for a spy, his humanity was just extraordinary like that. Now, uh, 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 there's a great story that goes with this. He's you know, Ons in civilian attire, and uh, uh, and uh, I, I'll read it to you right here. Uh, An remained an American uh, an America file throughout his life. Uh, so here he is aboard the Vandegrift in November 2003. Right on the day An was in civilian attire, and the only one to recognize him on the Vietnamese delegation side was a colonel, who approached him and said in Vietnamese. Excuse me, are you General Pham Soon An? An looked up and said, yes, I am. And the colonel said to him back in Vietnamese, nice meeting you, sir. And with An surrounded with so many high-ranking American dignitaries, the colonel asked, General An, which side were you a general for? <laughs> and An said, An, An said, both sides. Uh, and the colonel was stunned. And then An laughed. He said, just kidding. Um, and then An said, you see, that is why they will never let me out. Because they still don't know who I am. And, uh, and that, I think, is the key to understanding it. Now, the good news is that I'm very excited to announce here, I mean, I've, people know, a, a, film, a movie is being made on my book about the life of Tham Soon An. I haven't seen the screenplay yet, but we've done the, uh, the promos already. They're, uh, uh, I'm very excited about this because how a film writer will create the arc of this man's life can go in any number of ways. I've optioned it three times here in the United States and it has never made it. Roger, uh, uh, Oliver Stone almost took it, but at the end it, he didn't, so it's just another, another uh, failure. But I, I'd rather see it made here in Hollywood, but it's going to be made in Asia and we'll see how, what, uh, you know, what, what kind of, what, 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 what kind of uh, what kind of, of job they do. So I have time for a few minutes of questions. I know I've, I've just tried to encapsulate it all in about 50 minutes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did that in about 55 minutes. Almost impossible, for, but I did. <laughs> uh, yes, any questions? Yeah. Professor Perkins, so you were working with him uh, right before he, he died. Did he have a good sense of how you were going to go about constructing Great the question. book? And what did you have come? Great the question. The writer himself, did he give you any critiques? Or? No, he, he, uh, so I actually addressed that right in the early passage of the book. He told me he didn't want to read it. He didn't want to comment on it. He didn't want to do anything until it was published. So he never asked me a single thing about what I was doing. He told me that it was my right to write the book. And he respected that. So never, ne nothing, zero. I mean, I would ask him sometimes to interpret things for me and to explain things, but he didn't want to influence my writing at all. What do you, what do you think he would have thought that he knew it fairly well? Well, so, uh, if I wasn't going to do this, I didn't have time, so I'll share something with you very privately right now, uh, which is, uh, I think that he, see, An told me only what he wanted to tell me. There are 380 of his secret reports that are locked up in Hanoi right now. And one day, a future generation of scholars will have access to those. And then we'll really know his full impact, right? I was much more interested in this book to tell the story of a spy, but also the story of the reconciliation. So I never knew what An thought of the book. But An's wife wrote me this email after reading it. Do you mind if I share it with you? Um, uh, Dear Larry, Christmas is approaching. My family and I wish you and your family a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We have to thank you once more for your book, Perfect Spy, and with congratulations, too late. We understand that besides what Ann told you, you had a hard, long research to write about him with, 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 with verifies. Mixing orderly historian, a regrettable war, 
with everything that went on between Vietnam and the United States. And the most important thing, An's request to you in writing this book, that you keep secret certain things that he told you could hurt his friends. He would say to me, I say this in the book, you, I'll tell you this as background, you can't use it in the book until I'm dead. But he was alive when the book, uh, the book came out. He is very grateful you kept your promise to him. If there is a spiritual world, An is happy for that. Uh, because my eyes problem, I have to read your book in three times during three days. Although I would like to finish it immediately. Three days of emotions, three days of tears, three days of missing, loving, regretting. And now each time I read it again, I cannot prevent my tears falling. And such feeling on my few friends too. But I'd like to read it again and again to recall my husband. Sometimes when reading it, it seems to me that An is still alive. But painfully, in reality, I cannot see him anymore forever. Half my body passed away. Uh, so that means a lot to me. But it, you know, I, be, I believe if she liked it, and she has welcomed me, and I didn't have any particular friendship with her, that she owed me anything for that, I believe An, that would have been An's reaction. And uh, so thank that was a great question. I think there was another hand. Please, this is your, uh, yes. Did he express any regret for, for what he did? I mean, he formed these relations with Americans. Was there any sort of regret that maybe his actions would have gotten people hurt, people who belong to a country? Uh, bingo, bingo, $5,000 question. You win, the, you win the jackpot. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, uh, I detail this in the book, which is uh, on ever, refused to ever admit, even to acknowledge, that his, because he loved Americans so much, he, he never saw the link between his reports and the death of Americans. He said to me, you know I could never, I, never, I didn't know I'd use a gun. Uh, and I would say, but your reports killed people, look what happened. And he would slam his fist on the table and he would say, no. He goes, and then he would go into his uh, tirade, all I wanted the, the Americans to do was to leave. Uh, so the answer is he never acknowledged it. And I, in the book I talk about it. And uh, that's as far as you can go with it, really. I mean, that, 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 that was it. So. And the critics of the book have suggested that uh, that is that th that is a book could be written about all the blood he has on his hands, and you know I've had to face that criticism in discussions, but that's fair enough. I mean, everyone has a chance. You know, everyone will write the book that they want to write and how they want to portray on. I chose to see his humanity and acknowledge his shortcomings in that in that in that one regard, uh, but uh, there was enough self there was enough destruction on that side that Americans did to Vietnam that I'm willing to forgive any Vietnamese for the destruction that occurred in, in, def in defense of their own, in their own country. An used to always say, how many Americans, how many, how many, how many Americans uh, do we have to kill before, did we have to kill before they left? You know, and, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a very powerful, when you think about what we did to the country, it's amazing that they've forgiven us in such a quick period of time uh, on that. So no, I mean, that's, I wish I could answer that. Also, I wish I could answer, I'll tell you the most difficult question for me is, is um, uh, I mean, this is a man whose spy craft was so good that I'm unable to uh, decipher if he was playing me, where he might have been playing me. But, so this book, one of the great honors of my life was, uh, so after 9-11, I, I, I talk about this in the book, after 9-11, um, which An was a tragic day in An's life. Uh, and this comes right to your question. An said, you know, the difference between me and those terrorists, because I said to An, you know, those terrorists, they live with us. You know, An was a singleton, a single cell person working alone. Those terrorists who flew into the tr Trade Center, they live with us, they got to know us, they work with us. They, I mean, they knew who we were. Right? They chose to kill us, right? So An, an argument you made, An just chose to kill us in a different way. An chose not to see it like that, because An said he could have never done something like that. Right? But instead, he wrote these reports that did result indirectly in the death, in, 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 in the death of Americans. But uh, after 9-11, I was contacted by, you know, by, by American Homeland Security, well, what would be uh, the exact office of America. They came to see me in my office as a professor at the University of California. Professors who were in the room, you might find this interesting, what your reaction would be. So they contact me. They want to know not what's in my book. Anyone can read the book, right? They want to know everything else An told me because they're trying to study human intelligence and how agents infiltrate society. And they want to see if An 
told me something that I wasn't smart enough to recognize because I'm not trained to recognize it. And do I have tapes? Do I have intelligence? So they came out to my office, and you know, I write in the book. On would, in many ways, I think, be happy that his life might be 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 used to defend the homeland, right, in some way. But in this case, they came to my office and they asked to see all my files. I knew they were coming, right, and. It's a, really, it's a really interesting issue as to you know, what you're going to let someone see and what you're not going to let them see. And I let them see everything because, it was, because the period after 9-11, this was a pretty serious time. It's still serious now. But, and I didn't think there was anything in there. But I have no idea what was in there. But they took it. They didn't take it. They, they took notes. They studied it. Uh, and uh, uh, they took copies, a lot of photographs and things like that. So about two years later, I got invited. This is required reading in... Um, in, uh, in, in, in CIA classes for, uh, on human intelligence. And one of the best times of my life was going there and, and meeting with new agents and talking about on, uh, in only one capacity, as a singleton, as a single cell. That's all they really care about. How do single cells operate? And the technique of survival for a single cell. So there's other stuff about, you know, Love of America, none of that matters. You know, it's just that single cell stuff. And I learned a whole of a lot uh, uh, there. Maybe didn't demonstrate it here, but I learned a lot uh, on that. And yeah. Um, so you kind of forged a unique relationship with your subject. How do you approach um, this kind of study or this kind of work after forming that sort of relationship? Ah, uh, so. You know, uh, so I, if you're a psychiatrist, you would know my next biography of Admiral Zumwalt, he was dead. Which was, uh, I, 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 so in other words, it's hard to write a biography of someone who's alive, who you're interviewing, and you also like, right? I mean, that's just the bottom line. I didn't dislike him. And I, I really liked him. And indeed, I, I enjoyed being around him pr primarily, because even before he told me I could write the book. I mean, I kept coming back for a reason. Uh, and that reason was it was a fascinating man, um, and I was learning a lot from him. So uh, I had to really fight to be objective. And if you ask me if I'm objective in this book, the answer is I'm objective. I, I tried to be as objective as possible, but it is true, as cr some critics have noted, that um, uh, it's hard to read this book and not feel like I almost liked Don, which I did. But then the question is, did I admire on? And that's really a fine line there, because I don't admire people who, who fight America, right? So that's sort of a, 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 a fine line. I, I admired the way he pulled off his job, the same way William Colby admired he pulled his job. But it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And there are parts in here, but I never reached a point where I ever said, I'm not going to put this in the book because it, uh, of my feeling towards on. I didn't put things in a book because uh, I thought if I put it in a book, it would hurt someone who was living, and that would, and that that would, that's that would have breached my promise with on. And there's going to be a lot of, you know, there's there's already another book on on. Uh, uh, there there'll be more books, and I envy the next generation like you of of, of and the, Viet, the young Vietnam scholars here. If you learn Vietnamese in 20 years, you'll be able to go into Vietnamese archives and read his reports. Uh, you'll learn a lot more. This country would have declassified files. So a question I'm often asked, for example, is. Do I think An was a how, he, how, okay? It's it's amazing he survived, right? How did he survive, right? I mean, he had to be protected. That's the argument. Someone had to be protecting him. It's it's inconceivable that you could have had this many drops, you know, uh, this 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 courier system that he had. And intelligence people tell me it's inconceivable that he could have survived for ten years doing this and never got detected ever. So who else was he working for that was protecting him? Was on tipping uh, information to the CIA or the British or the French? And the answer is that I don't know. All right? I did a FOIA request on on in this country. <coughs> I searched CIA records. I couldn't find anything here. I've, uh, I've, I've gone to lunch. You know, there's a club called the Retired uh, uh, Intelligence Officers of America. It's a dynamic group in, in Virginia. I've had a, two lunches there. None of them feel, uh, they, they feel that if An was working for the American CIA, something would have shown up already. There would have been something that some, one of the agents would have found. So I've dismissed that, but they, none of them feel you can dismiss the French or the British. Uh, so maybe, maybe he was, uh, he was being protected like that. Maybe it was more than living under a lucky star and with his wife, uh, you know, help it, helping him. Another mystery is, that's always asked is, 
why An was allowed to marry to An, his wife, because she was not a member of the party. Um, and it was a real dangerous, they had spent so much, they had so much, in, and they didn't get married until after he came back to Vietnam. He was starting his mission, and uh, he fell in love with her. And when he said he wanted to marry her, the party said no, because they had arranged a marriage for him. And it was an arranged marriage with a, you know, an, a, an army officer, uh, but someone who was going to pretend not to be an army officer. Uh, and An said no, and he threatened to quit. And uh, they really tried to twist him, but, uh, and this is in all four biographies of him, two Vietnamese and two Americans. This story, is, and the Vietnamese have confirmed this. Um, uh, uh, they decided to let, uh, let, let him go ahead with the marriage. And she turned out to be an incredibly loyal um, uh, uh, assistant to the spy. But she was not a member of the party, not a, not a member of the party at all on that. And, you know, and finally, you know, An uh, said, some of the things he said after the war that I find particularly interesting is, if I had known I was trading the, uh, um, uh, the Soviets for the Americans, uh, the Americans for the Soviets, I would have stuck with the Americans, right? That's how he viewed the war. Uh, uh, but the problem is, is that no one wanted to hear what he had to say. There was this one meeting which I put in the book where he tries to explain uh, to his uh, newfound uh, bosses uh, all the benefits of American capitalism, right? But these are the Americans who have just killed hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese, who have sprayed defoliated jungles, have, have bombed Hanoi, have killed you know, collateral damage, have, have hit hospitals, done all this stuff. The last thing the Vietnamese wanted to hear in 1975 was how good the Americans were. So it was just all just for naught for a period of nine years. But in the end, the life of a spy is, is, uh, uh, it goes, go, go, goes, goes, full, goes full circle. So he's really remembered today in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, you know, he's, he's reached this hero. He's an iconic figure in Vietnam. There are statues for him. Uh, 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 that hotel room that he stayed in, room uh, 307 at the Continental, it has a plaque outside that I wrote. And it's my room. Uh, I stay in that room all the time. Of, uh, and and uh, people from all over come just to take pictures of An's room. And if you go on um, TripAdvisor, you could read about reviews of people who stay in Pham Son An's room in, 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 in the Hotel Continental. So it's really become an extraordinary sort of thing in, in, in Vietnam, but not just for, for the war, for the peace as well. Uh, I interviewed four American ambassadors for this book, and all four considered An to be a dear, close, personal friend. So, one time. We have to leave it there, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Dr. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.